Well, good afternoon or evening, wherever you are situated. It's me again. It's World War II TV, and we are going to be discussing a rather interesting battle that took part in Normandy, took place in Normandy in June 1944. My guest today, an old friend, we've known each other a long, long time, Marty Morgan, who was a, a star on the We Have Ways of Making You Talk podcast recently with James and Al. So um, that's good. So um, welcome to the show, Marty. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of it, Paul. So we are talking about a village in Normandy, about 15 miles south of Carentan. And what I'm going to do, we've kind of broken this show down, folks, into sort of four parts. And the first bit is going to be me giving a brief version of events as they have been told for a long time. I'm hoping a lot of you have seen on Twitter the, the link I put to the account by Keith Nightingale. And he's happy with us sharing that, by the way, he and Marty are in conversation. This is the conventional version of the history. So on D-Day. About 150 paratroopers of the 507th and the 501st end up being misdropped quite a long way from their drop zones in a little village southwest of Carenton, surrounded by marshland, where they encounter the local French population who they go work together with. They decide to defend this little hilltop village. And it's all going rather well until lots and lots of 17th SS people and vehicles start attacking and a couple of days of that. And then you have a situation where the 17th SS overwhelm the defenses of this village. There's a, uh, a, a, a massacre that takes place of some of the survivors. There's a bit of a free for all. Some escape, some don't escape. Uh, and the, the, the Germans set fire to the church, they kill a number of the civilians, and this story grows out of that. And that's kind of the conventional version of the story as was told. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of look at how that story came about in the first place, look at the reasons why it came about in such a format, and then talk about Marty's two-decade reinvention reanalysis of this event to actually make sense of it and understand really what happened so and and, and I'll, I'm, the, I'm going to admit that is what I used to think happened there myself and I have stood at that church there many times indeed with Marty back in the day 2003 4 5 6 7 and we told that version of the and by the way I, I didn't add the heroic kind of um the, the, the ending of this story is it prevents the 17th SS from getting to Carenton. So therefore, when the 101st attack it, the 17th SS are there. So there's this idea that the sacrifices take, that took place in this village were worth it because there's this, there's this gain. Um, so uh, that's, that's the conventional version, isn't it, Marty? Kind of, yeah? Yeah, that's really what I call the traditionalized narrative of the Battle of Glen. And we're, before we actually um, talk about yeah, Marty's work, we're going to look at now the era when this story kind of surfaced, because it was around 2004, 60th anniversary, which is probably the first big televised and internet kind of anniversary. The 50th had been televised, but the 60th was big. It's the first big groups coming over from the USA, big groups from Britain. Normandy was huge that year. And you have people like Tom Brokaw and others. And, and a lot of the, the, the first generation of historians were still around and touring back then. And this is also a year, folks, after the whole Freedom Fries debacle, which we won't go into, but there's been some there's been a trickiness between the USA and France and Britain and France because of the and, and this story, which at its heart has this this Go, um, this um, ang uh, American Franco against the odds kind of working together um, spirit fulfilled a need at that time for that kind of story. So, so how, tell us, Marty, how did you first discover the story? How did you get involved in it? And, and, and give a bit of that backstory in that regard. I came over with a reunion group from the 507th in July 2002. The purpose of the trip overall was to dedicate the monument that's uh, just um, what's it's just there to the west of Coquigny. What is that? Les Elpiquets? Is that where the monument is, I think? Um, near Amphreville, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, near Amphreville. Yeah. I should just see that. Yeah, we came good. over to dedicate that memorial. The, mem the memorial dedication was the last, the last formal event that we did on the fifth day of a visit over. So we had travel days ahead of time. And during the days that preceded the memorial dedication, we traveled to a number of places for these sort of pre-arranged um, 
these prearranged memorial ceremony events. Like, for example, we went to Aramanche and we went to a few other places. Glen was one of the places that we visited and it was, I, there was so very little written about 507th back then that it was difficult for me to scrape together information about it. I, through friends, um, knew uh, Bob Ray's son-in-law, who is the person that invited me to go along with this trip. We were moving around in six different buses. We had 65 veterans with us. We pulled up at the church at Glen, and it was the first time I'd ever seen the place and also the first time I'd ever heard the story. And it, it, it grabbed me. It's an, it's an arresting story. It's a fascinating story. Part of what fascinated me about it was this, this old version, what, what I call the traditionalized narrative of the battle, because that traditionalized narrative, it has, it has all of the makings of, an, of a motion picture. It's, it's got very, very compelling qualities. Um, a, a hopeless battle against the odds, imposing incredibly high casualties on the enemy, the, the French defying German authoritarianism to help the allied liberators. And then it was all kind of iced over with the, the best part of all being the idea that by holding the hilltop, they had materially, in, uh, materially changed the outcome of the Battle of Carantan. And that, that's how the story was presented to me at first. And it's now, what, 18 years later. And I understand there to have been a very, very different battle and a very, very different episode there. But at the time, I didn't know that. And I got sucked into it. I ultimately became involved with a, a woman that lived there to the point that I was spending a lot of time in the village. And her father knew all the old timers and I got to spend kind of a lot of time around people that survived 1944 that were there, many of whom are now gone. Uh, but it, it, having that experience drew me further and further in. We made this documentary, I call it a documentary, but it's, it was for a TV series on the History Channel in the US that was called Investigating History. It was hosted by this kind of well-known American correspondent journalist named Bill Curtis. And what we made was called D-Day, The Secret Massacre, where we filmed on location in Tribu and in Glen. And then we filmed on location here about five miles from my house in Southern Louisiana. And that was one of the one of several TV shows I was involved in for the 60th anniversary. And Paul, maybe you might remember it like I do, but my memory now of having participated in 60th anniversary, 70th anniversary, and 75th anniversary was the 60th anniversary was a much bigger show than any of them, from my perspective at least. In in terms of veterans, absolutely. Yeah. And the sheer numbers, but but it had this less slick way of running they in the years as they've seemed to be more organized but more organized chaos we seem to better get away with bigger numbers back in 2004 and it somehow work okay i don't know why it did but it, yeah it, 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 they were they were bigger weren't they i think they were yeah yeah i mean and it, and it the 60th had a charm that i mean i i forgot the 65th i was there for the 65th when president obama spoke at the cemetery and and um, I heard him speak at the cemetery twice and heard President Trump speak there last year. And there was a charm to the 60th anniversary that just was lacking in a way for 65th, for 70th and for 75th. Um, but still, the a big thing about the 60th was I was in the months leading up to 60th anniversary, which is when my first book came out about the 507th. I was just bombarded by TV shows. And we made this TV show, D-Day, The Secret Massacre. In addition to my, the one project I worked on with Tom Brokaw, which was for Dateline NBC, which was a program that it's kind of hard to find out there on the internet now, but it's out there and it's called D-Day, A Jump or A Leap Into History, I think, A Leap Into History. And it was, it was examining, it was traveling back with well, Frank Naughton, um, who's now no longer with us, and his grandson and a couple of other veterans. And it had a charming quality. And I'm mentioning all of that just because there seemed to have been so much more media attention associated with the 60th than even the 75th, which I assumed would be the biggest and best show of them all. And it had a sterile stage managed quality that, that just really didn't do it for me. But anyway. I think I, also we've I, done so many now 
yeah. in a way that, that that you know it's like just another gig isn't it you know it's, uh, it's some i'm kind of looking forward to the next era because i hope that that the youth will do something now the veterans won't be coming i hope there's some new way of celebrating it commemorating it but anyway we we digress there but right. but we the thing that. about the 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 two that era the 2004 is that the, the story of grania was this was this perfect you, you said it yourself it was this perfect beginning middle and end it had all the right qualities of 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 sacrifice and togetherness and and when you when i, mean, I remember being there beside you and they, they were playing the national anthems there and the french national anthem marseillaise and america so it all seemed so perfect and so and so um balanced and and, and so and that's about the time i was building up my tour company Sean who's watching was working for me then and we that's about there I don't know exactly when 2004 2003 we started taking our tour groups to Grania yeah? and we started telling this what we will now refer to as the old version of the story and it used to get amazing reactions because you could you could conduct the story like you would like a, like an orchestra leader and you had the drama the peril the the danger the escape the sacrifice and you walk them to the monument and they look at these french and americans who died together and the re, the restored village and it had all those and you drive off and it was always the last stop we did in the first day of a two-day tour and you know you just because that in fact we used to mirror by doing it the last day of the first, last stop on the first day, our last stop on the second day was American Cemetery at Omaha. And they kind of worked exactly the same kind of story. They they gave, they left your customers with a really good finale and a kind of a, a feel good factor, which is an odd way. Sean picked me up on using that, but I meant feel good in the sense of having all the ingredients of a good narrative. Yeah. Not feel good in the death, but feel good in the, and these men died for this cause. And thankfully they, they, and then in my case, what happened over the next few years, I started taking people, perhaps war gamers or people who'd read it, read it a little bit more widely. And they started asking me questions about things. And I started going, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. No, I don't know. That doesn't, when you say it that way, that doesn't make sense. We, you and I had discussions. And then Ian Dalgleish got involved, who sadly we lost in an air crash because he was a brilliant historian, aerial photos. He got involved, then he died. And, uh, and then then Sean and Niels, Niels Henkerman, who's also watching, got involved. And and I, I haven't, I personally haven't taken a tour group to Grania for, well, I've taken about three in the last five or six years. And I've taken them to there saying, look, let's go there and examine it as kind of friends and colleagues, but I might spoil it a bit. <laughs> and yeah, and so anyway, that that's that's where this we are with this story. I kind of started losing faith in it, and so eighteen years you've been working at it. So let's let's look at the um the uh, the story and try to take it apart and say what have we learned? Well, when I say what have we learned, what have you learned since that that brings into question this story? Yeah. I mean, a lot, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> do, you, do we have how many hours do we have? Um, I guess the first thing that's jumping into my mind is the casualties. Um, with, with help from, from Sean and from Nils, we have learned that the casualties were definitely nowhere close to what was previously thought. Just in passing, I read over some old publications and old documents about this to include Colonel Nightingale's art article. And Colonel Nightingale repeated exactly what I had put in my first book and exactly what we were all repeating. And that was 500 Germans killed in the June 11th battle with 700 wounded. And the interesting thing about that is that between me, you, Sean, and Nils, we've been, we haven't been able to reconcile 100 German casualties total. It's looking like the total German casualties for the action might be less than 50. That's killed, wounded, and missing. I mean, in other words, we're looking at possibly, in terms of German killed in action, a handful, and that's it. And, and in this way, the traditionalized narrative departs in a breathtaking, in, in, an, in an astonishing way from what we can reconcile in actual physical evidence and, and hard reports. That's the first big thing that comes out in my mind is just that there's such a breathtaking difference in the traditionalized narrative, which is effectively just folklore and the actual reality of casualties during that battle and that and that's when we talked about doing this program although we are talking about the battle in this village we're also using it in effect as a case study 
of how other stories from Normandy and beyond have taken on this kind of life of their own and and have have become there are you know you can't doubt them anymore they've become set in stone and we could you know we reel off things like point du hawk and things like that that yeah you know, there's there's and you and you and you're stuck when you're a tour guide or a historian is when you're with a group there do you kind of go the traditional i'm going to say it how they want to hear it and how it's easy to do it in the time i've got or do you go okay do you want me to rewrite your entire world for you but then you need time you need time to do that and you've got to kind of take it take apart the old version layer up the new version hope they don't get angry with you while you're doing that your clients or your whoever you're talking to and so this that's why this Grania story is so fascinating it is a it is a case study of how and when you when you said that i'm interrupting myself when you said that at 500 i can't now believe that i used to stand there and say that yeah and it didn't I, seem I, at all nonsensical I can't, believe, then. I can't believe i published it i'm ashamed of myself when i think back but back then we had nothing else. It's not like it was me being lazy and I just didn't dig deep enough. I dug into absolutely everything I possibly could. And if there's one thing I was guilty of, it was taking eyewitness accounts as absolute gospel. Because that's where that number came from. The veterans were telling me that, the French survivors were telling me that. And I'm not saying that I... I have disrespect or contempt for their service or for where they were. And I'm not presuming myself to be smarter than they were. However, when I just on the cold, with cold objectivity, base it on um, fact and evidence, I cannot rec reconcile their personal accounts with, with the hard cold facts. And if there's one thing I've learned in my 18 years of leading tours in Normandy, and maybe you'll harmonize with me on this, that is that the, the personal and eyewitness accounts often contradict things that actually happened. Yeah, it's become the point where I'm using them increasingly for emotional color and less for the factual explanation of a battle. Um, you, know, you, need, you need to have accounts of people who were there. They, if a veteran tells you, I was shit scared when I was in that foxhole when that tank was coming towards you, they may mistake the Panzer IV for a tiger, but they're not mistaking the emotion of it. And it's like with this hundreds. I've, I remember I've said to myself in Omaha several times when people say, you know, people refer to there being hundreds of dead on any one part of Omaha Beach. I go, well, it can't have been hundreds of dead on any one part of the beach because it was only hundreds of the entire beach. But I say to people, how many dead bodies would you have to see before you would use the word hundreds to describe it? <laughs> it's an emotional, it's an emotional description, not a physical description. If I was in the middle of a place where there was a number of dead bodies, it might feel like hundreds to me, even if it was actually just 17 for, for argument's sake. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've never been in a position where I've been around dead bodies. So I don't know how my, in, in a quantity, by the way. So I don't know how my brain would react in that situation, but that's, you know, that, that same account, that video, that, which one it is, when the machine gunner, um, what's the machine gunner from um, Grania? The... Never, oh, from, oh, you mean John Hinchliffe? Hinchliffe, yeah, when he's there and he looks very earnest and very serious, he's talking about using his 30 cal and hundreds of Germans um, dropping in front of him. And it's it's very compelling and it's very heartfelt. And and if you if I had been there in that recording, I would have not wanted to go up to him in the middle of that and say, it wasn't hundreds, mate. It was dozens. It would have been inappropriate and offensive of me to do that. But now in the cold light of day, you realize there's no substance right. to that. And you mentioned John Hitchcock, and, and I would be neglectful not to mention that he passed away last month. He was the actual last survivor of the 507th who fought in Normandy and therefore the last survivor among the Americans who fought in this battle. Uh, and so that I consider that to be this major threshold that we only just crossed about 30 days ago. Wow. And it was sad and he died from COVID-19 by the way. Oh dear. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's sad to see him go, but it, if anything, it illustrates to me that we've moved into a new era and it is the era where veterans are no longer part of the living memory of, of, of the battle in Normandy. And we got everything we could get from them. They're not all of them, but at least from my department from the 507th, they're all gone now. And it's put me in this position of recognizing that, well, whatever happens next, whatever's going on about talking about the 507th 25 years from now, it's not going to be it's not going to involve the veterans. It, 
might involve some things that I've written or some things that I've done work on. Uh, but the era of the veteran participating in our memory of these events has concluded. Yeah, I mean, so so let, let's let's start. Let's talk first um, about how they ended up being in in Granny, because that bit hasn't really changed. The reason for the missed drops. Um, that's that's I'll, I'll pull up a couple of maps. So I'll, I'll put the maps up, and you, you kind of explain the story. So um, there's the first one there. So Grania is down here, southwest. And as everyone who's watching this knows, the Air Armada came in west to east to avoid, you know, to, come, to be the long way round over Cotentan. And, and as a lot of people watching will know, there's this cloud bank and, and fog and stuff on the coast there. So this is where an error occurs with this particular flight, isn't it, Marty? It is. Right when they were crossing the, the coast just north of Barneville Carteret, there was to be one final course correction. So they flew in between Guernsey and Alderney to exploit the gap in anti-aircraft capabilities. And when they hit the coast, there was supposed to be a course correction that would take them directly over toward um, the area of drop zone T just to the east of Goobersville and Omfreville. Yeah. And what we know now, and the second map illustrates it more effectively, is that the, that course correction did not take place. And the result is that then the aircraft continued on for a period of between 10 minutes and 15 minutes without, um, without executing that course correction. It brought them directly over Marais du Fetz, which is that marshy area south of Carentan, the marshy area that's, that's, that's cut into by the Vier, the Vier Tote Canal. And they dropped them. And the main culprit was the 53rd Troop Carrier Squadron. It wasn't every aircraft in the squadron. It was 10 aircraft, but that kind of amounts to a lot of people. That's a, in the neighborhood of 150 paratroopers that were dropped. It's almost exactly 15 miles south of their drop zone, which is catastrophic in terms of an airborne operation. Yeah. And, and so Sorry, yeah. Yeah. they weren't alone. And then, of course, we we know of at least one aircraft from B Company 501st, 101st Airborne Division, that dropped in the area as well. I actually believe that there were more aircraft that were involved in the miss drop from both 53rd Troop Carrier Squadron and whatever squadron it was that carried B 501st, um, and that as they approached Marais du Fetz that they began dropping, and some troopers landed toward the west side toward St. George de Bouillon, mm -hmm. and some landed toward the east side, which would bring them into the area where they eventually emerged from the marsh at the at, uh, Port Saint-Pierre, which is where the Rigaud family lived. And so I think there were some people that could have been in this battle, but they ended up on the west side of the Tote Canal instead of on uh, the west side of the Tote River instead of on the east side in, in the marsh area. And they, I think, probably just moved north, rejoined the 101st, and that's how they avoided being a part of this bigger story um, in the marshes south of Carentan. I mean, but for those who haven't been there, with the, the, the floods in that area, the Marais does create this. Well, I'll, I'll share that aerial image that's, that's amazing, the, the, the satellite one that you sent me a number of years ago that shows just perfectly how the, the Grainia village there is surrounded by a, a, and this is a modern flood this is why you know it floods every two or three winters approximately depending on how much rainfall we've had and so if you if you imagine some men who'd been misdropped over here or misdropped over there their natural course of evasion is going to be somewhere else isn't it that's going they're not going to end up in this little bit here so but that is a very good way of conveying just how isolated this little um uh, spur of, of, of high ground is here where this battle took place and Caranton is off here to the north. So that's that's an effective way of explaining that. So so how they got there, that hasn't changed, has they? And I, I suppose at this point we should mention the protagonist. We should mention the 17th day. Because already on YouTube, I'm watching a quest, the, the comments coming in. People are saying, how did you guys found out it was find out it wasn't the 500 who were killed, but only 50? Well, that's the examination of the German archives. And that is something that particularly has been more recent, our access to the German archives than it was 20 years ago, partly just because of the swiftness of communication. Even today, setting up the show, you're sending me things via Facebook Messenger. Niels is sending things to me and you, Sean is, and we couldn't do that. 20 years ago. So, so the ability to, to, to get these archives and Niels Henkerman, who's for those who are watching, 
he's doing a two-part volume about the German troops in the Cotentin in, in 1944, and it will become the Bible of the studies of the German forces in Normandy. And he's accessed lots and lots of files of the 17th SS and the, the Army Corps there, and indeed married them up with American archives, which aren't always the, the information isn't always in the place you're expecting it. It's, it's in G2 and G3 and S1 and S3. You have to, you can't just go to after action reports of one particular unit. You've got to spread yourself out far and wide. Then when you start pulling it together. And so when, when well, I'll let Marty speak in a minute, but this, this idea of the German numbers, it is all based on hard evidence from German documentation about exactly how many troops they had in the area. And the thing is, this idea, this original version of the story is the whole division of the 17th SS was stuck at Grenier. And of course, we now know that to be baloney. It was, it was elements of, and I'll just show up this map of the, the Neil sent me. This is a, um, from Neil's today. And this is um, a German map. And Grenier is here. Yeah. You can see that there. And this is one of the movements going up here. And there are other movements. I'm not going to too detail, much detail yet about which regiment that is. I'm just presenting in general terms that they're moving in various directions towards various places. And they're not all converging by any means on the village of Grenier, which, uh, in, in the, in the, is, which is in this area here. So Lemonil Ango, uh, uh, this is where they're converging. So, um, yeah, so... It's, it's an investigation of archives and then just lots of going there and standing there and going, this doesn't make sense. So we know how we, we've established how they got there now. Um, the next part of the story is the getting involved with the French. Now, the, the, um, the, the, there's a, the, the, the village is two parts of the village now. If you go there now, there's the old part on the hill and there's the new part down where they replaced the village after war. And any paratroop who landed near there would have naturally gravitated towards the high ground. And then we have um, Benton Broussard comes in the story, which I'll let you explain in a minute, who is a French speaking Cajun. And he's the instigator of the relationship that established between the Americans and the French. And I, before I let Marty talk again, want to make the case right now that anything we're doing to investigate the truth of this story is in no way take anything away from the French or in any way um, damaging the relationship that was established between paratroopers and the French there. All of that is true. All of these connections that were made, all of these little friendships, none of that has been changed by the story. It is only the, uh, the, the, um, the data around it, I suppose, that's been, that's been changed. So, so, so pick up the story of these guys landing there. They've been misdropped because of the turn and, and where the old story starts deviating from the new story. Yeah, the point at which they um, dawn June sixth, they they have they're for the most part assembling in the area around Port de Plank, which I think is an important detail because um, it, it, it's indicating that the paratroopers didn't actually land really they really didn't land close to the village itself. They're landing in the marsh area to the north and west of the village. So if you point to Port de Plank on there, it's they're they're landing up in that area. And they, they assemble at the Rigaud farm. Benton Broussard, who is one of three French speakers among the American paratroopers, the other two being um, uh, uh, Barragona and Abraham's, Captain Abraham Safi and the battalion surgeon could also apparently speak French. And they begin communicating with the French with a, apparently Broussard doing more of it than anyone. And Major Johnston, he appropriates Broussard and is beginning to use him as an interpreter. They move from that area to the northwest of the hilltop. They move to the village in the afternoon on June 6th. And that's the point at which Barragona, I'm sorry, Broussard is, there he is, there's Benton himself. His family gave me that. He had um, a younger sister at the time. And when we showed the TV show D-Day the Secret Massacre in 2004, the family reached out to me because they, they live near Lafayette, Louisiana, which is only two hours from here. And I, they, they had a barbecue and invited me to come to it. And I met his sister and his sister sat down and wanted me to tell her what happened to him. Because all, all they got was a telegram saying first missing in action in Normandy and then ultimately declared killed in action. 
Um, but that, I just mentioned that as a, a, an interesting moment, which is why I use that that moment to describe to people why I think it's important for people like you and Nils and Sean to do what you do, because I'm sure you've been in the same position I've been in, and that is you're helping the family figure out what happened. Which Yes, which also can be a negative path because you start getting involved in it yourself, and then you start <laughs> not wanting to spoil what they've begun to believe is the outcome. And then you're actually just undermining, you, you know, no, none of us as historians, tour guides want to tell someone said, actually your great uncle, your grandfather died for nothing. It was a pointless battle. It had no outcome and they all just died. I'm sorry about that. That's, that is probably one of the worst things you can say to someone. You would much rather say, actually what you did saved 15,000 lives, 10 miles down the road, because that it's so your uncle is a great hero. And that's, but you get to a point where you've reached this kind of moral um, compass. Which way do you go? Do you do you? They they say the truth is always best, but when you're facing someone who's talking about their relative, it's very hard. And you got you went for a period when you were kind of almost a, an honorary citizen of Grainer. You spent as much of your year there as you were in, in Louisiana. Yeah. And and I remember you saying to me and Sean, you know, you you kind of you're too far in now. You're too in. You know, you 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 don't have to knock on the door when you go to the mayor's house anymore, kind of thing. And and then saying, actually, you know, this story you've built up around here, it's 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 not quite what you thought. That's that's yeah. tough. It puts you in a strange position. And, I, and I'm glad you mentioned the mayor because Dennis Small, who has been central throughout all of this, stretching a time period that's approaching now two decades who has freely given up his time, has been nothing but a complete gentleman and a prince throughout everything. And just, you know, just to give a round of applause to everybody, I should point out that where we are now in terms of information on this battle, uh, it couldn't, we wouldn't have gotten here if it was just me by myself doing it. It brought, a team came together to get us here. Mayor Small is central to that team. You're a part of that team. Sean's a part of it. Nils is a part of it. And it's all, it's, it's a group of people working together toward the, the understanding of this one battle. And where we are now is so vastly different than where we were 18 years ago when it was effectively just kind of word of mouth, folklore, and a couple of personal accounts. Now we're beginning to reconcile personal accounts with written reports and then reconciling like that's why I sent those last few documents I sent you this morning were it was we were able to reconcile German reports and American reports where they're reporting the exact same thing and I'm finding that the more I dig into the Normandy story the more that I find that the old mythologies crumble and the only way I begin to feel com comfortable with the story is when there's sort of um, across different tiers, you have the ability to reconcile uh, personal accounts with written American records and with written German records. And that's why this feels like such a more comfortable place than it was 18 years ago, because we're able to do that. And we're able to understand, therefore, with kind of a great deal of pinpoint specificity, exactly who was involved. We're able to get a sense of the numbers involved. The numbers, I think, are such a critical part of this story because the, the numbers on the US side and the French side were never really in doubt. We have the memorial, the, memo the memorial in the, in the earliest version had a list of names that then changed to a second version, which through the help of a guy named Brian Sadal, we figured out that that second version was not entirely accurate. And we've moved now to the third version, which is the the list of names that's on the wall at the, at the Franco-American Memorial today. And that list is sharp and I'm pretty sure it's gonna stay. And we're finally, we're finally at a version that we have a great deal of confidence about. And I find that to be fascinating because the list of names on the wall there now represents the culmination of not 18 years of effort, but 50 years of effort. But the first, the, 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 um, the dedication of the Franco-American Memorial is something that dates back to the 1950s. And the first list of names, I think, goes up in the 1960s, around the 20th anniversary. And so we're, we're now looking at, if we count that earlier research effort, that, that's, this is a research effort that's going back almost 70 years now. And so that, 
where we are with the, the US casualties and the French casualties, we're, we're at a really comfortable place. And the only area that has not been well documented and well covered now is the total German casualties. And that's why since the, the French and American casualties represented sort of a closed book, I keep saying French, American, and Australian. Yeah, um, they mustn't forget Mr. Black. I yeah. can't forget Stanley K. Black because yeah. when I first heard this voice, when I first heard this story, I had no idea that an Australian was there fighting side by side with American paratroopers and that he lost his life on that hilltop. I think he was on the hilltop. I don't think he's at the second battle, but I guess we'll get to that shortly. We'll get to the second anyway. battle. And for those watching, he was air crew who just ended up there by just shit happens, circumstances. As the 29ers who got there, because if you go north from Grainier, you end up in Montmartin on Grainier, which also adds a complication of archives sometimes saying Grainier yep. when they mean Montmartin on Grainier, and they're two separate villages and two separate areas that aren't really connected at all, except they're not very far away in the grand scheme of things. And they just kind of wandered in, cut off from a 175th push south. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? Absolutely. So they end up there as well. Um, so, but numbers are the key thing as well. And, 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 and it's not just the numbers of Germans. It's this, we go back to the original version of the story that they, they, they do, the, they, they, they stand on the hill, they stand and fight their weapons positions around the hill. The 17th SS in overwhelming numbers uh, eventually wipe them off the, field, the hill and then they destroy the village. And I remember again, standing there reading and it's, I can, I can see the books, 124 buildings dis, uh, partially destroyed, 78 uh completely destroyed and you drive around grain and say well what but the village isn't that big now it was never that big <laughs> how, how, where have we got this huge number of houses from and and, and i i say i like yourself i kept having these moments where does that where's that come from right because that and, number is wildly inaccurate and i i i i'm at a point now where i'm making these guesses about things that happened there but and I should, you know, I feel almost like I need to apologize about guesses, but for God's sake, it's 18 years later. I feel like I've been married to this battle for the better part of my adult life. And I feel like I can make some educated guesses from time to time. And one of the educated guesses I'm making is that there was obviously a fire at the church at some point. It definitely was not on June 11th, but more on that in a minute. Uh, that, but yeah. when the fire occurred there eventually, I can imagine that when the church was on fire, it probably looked from some observer some distance away, it probably looked like the whole village was on fire. And I believe that's what led ultimately to this exaggerative process that had it that a hundred something structures were burned down. And an important detail I mentioned is that there's a little house that's directly across from where the church memorial is now that's there in the aerial photography, the famous June 17th aerial photograph. That house is there on June 17th, that house is still there now. And that house, in addition to basically three or four other structures, that's all that was on the hilltop. Yeah. There's nothing else up there. And there were residents that were um, in the immediate area, but they were not on the hilltop. So on the hilltop, I think that if you count out absolutely every last structure up there, you might be able to come up with 10 separate structures, but that's all. Yeah, so where it's a, where it's the idea area, isn't it? and yeah. again when we go and examine this idea about how this story came together that the old version the the need for there to be lots and lots of destruction on the half of the ss was was critical to how the way they wanted this story to go so i don't know what they i don't know who exactly created this first version but they didn't consider questioning it they whether they'd not been there they'd not stood there and looked at it critically but they just had this idea of hundreds of buildings destroyed. And again, we, we repeated it. We, 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 we shared this data and you go, I don't know where it's coming from. Um, but the, the church is, well, let's, should we talk about the, um, uh, the decision making? Cause that's, that's, that's the fascinating thing as well is that the, the two, the, the two commanding officers there, um, well, Major Johnson of the 507th and Bogart of the 501st, we seem to think had differing ideas of what to do right from the beginning, but that is all based on what people said of them because neither of those two men survived the battle. So you do have to kind of wonder whether or not what, pe what decisions people attributed to them were actually what they said they did or what they actually did, but they had different different ideas yeah. about what to do. 
Um, so let's talk about that story and how that that to me is a, a fundamental um, difficulty with this under, of this battle is the lack of people who survived who had a any responsibility during it. Yeah, you know, people like John Hinchcliffe was was low in the chain of command, so therefore he only knows the story as someone who was given instructions by someone else. Um, when you take other pivotal actions of D-Day, Lafayette, Brevon, Poopville, um, there's always that surviving major colonel who's got a version of Grenier. The only surviving key person of rank is Captain Francis Norton, who has an insp- who we now we're not a hundred percent certain that everything he said. I'm being very polite. Was <laughs> entirely how it was. Is that fair? Uh, that's entirely fair. And um, just for the full sake of disclosure, I was ultimately excommunicated from the fellowship of the 507th um, over a dispute that Colonel Naughton had, or Judge Naughton had, with me over the total number of men. I, in my book and in one of the documentaries, and, and Colonel Naughton provided an interview for D Day the Secret Massacre. And in the final cut of it, we mentioned 182 men. Um, and he, he had a very strong negative reaction to that when it came out. And I got chewed out kind of a lot until I was ultimately excommunicated from the 507th and I was no longer invited to attend reunions and things like that. Um, and it was it, the origins of that dated to this dispute over the numbers. Um, and not that I want to say anything negative about him, because before we had this dispute, he was a complete gentleman to me. I mean, I, I spent more hours interviewing Frank Naughton than anyone else from 507th. Um, and then this dispute happened over the total number. Um, then a few years later, um, the, the morning reports, this original document emerged from the, the, the archives, and it was uh, it was Sergeant Major Selesky's morning reports that confirmed exactly 182 men from 507 and 501st, um, which made me in the end kind of like roll my eyes like, why? so why did we have to have this big dispute when the number was never really in dispute in the end? Um, Naughton also disliked the way that we characterized him in the documentary, and that's what led to this chill between me and him later in his life, and I wasn't even informed of his death until after the funeral, which is a little bit of a sore spot for me because I warmed up to that man. Um, An interesting detail is that long before the era of Saving Private Ryan, which I consider to be um, pivotal in terms of assessing and evaluating original source material, uh, particularly personal accounts. Any personal account that predates Private Ryan, I pay closer attention to it. And uh, there was another 507th officer named Dave Brummett, who I never got a chance to meet. He died before I got interested in the story, shortly before I got interested in it. And Brummett left a very detailed personal account from shortly after the war. And I was, re- I read it over again for the one millionth time right before we came, um, before I came onto the show. And it interested me very much that Brummett, uh, Naughton told me about it originally, but Brummett had come up with a plan just after they got to the hilltop in the, late in the day on June 6th, where Brummett's account is that Major Johnston told him, I want you to give me a, a total head count, give me um, an inventory of gear and equipment and come up with a plan for what we're going to do. Brummett worked up a plan to, to conduct a, a quote, sort of complicated exfiltration from the hilltop, crossing the marsh of the, the area around the Virtote Canal and making their way to the 101st Airborne Division north of Carentan. He came up with that idea, as I recall, late in the day, probably at night on June 6th, presented it to Major Johnston on June 7th, and Major Johnston, rejected it outright. He just, he dismissed it and and was, and what Naughton told me was that he was sort of rude and curt about dismissing it. When Captain Brummett wrote this personal account after the war, he was very particular to say that we stayed there like he made us, the enemy showed up, the enemy overran us, and then we, in the end, did exactly what I proposed on the first day. We, We left the hilltop and evacuated the area. And he is, he's, He's not faint about saying we should have done what I proposed from the start. And that brings up the possibility. My, 
my first instinct is I find him to be very believable. I don't think he had an agenda at work, but there's always the possibility that in the aftermath of the war with Charles Johnston no longer around to tell his side of the story, it could have been his idea from the start and Brummett appropriated his idea. I don't think that happened. I think it was Brummett's idea. This is what Naughton told me, but Brummett was very careful to go, we should have done, we should have gone with my plan from the beginning. And if we'd done that, we wouldn't have left more than 30 dead people on the hilltop. Um, at any rate, mm. it, it, it doesn't matter. It's an, imp- it's an incredibly important personal account. And in it, he, he basically establishes broad parameters for the way that the French were helping. He singles out certain individuals for praise. He singles out Frank Naughton for a great deal of praise because Frank Naughton was the headquarters company 3rd Battalion 507th communications officer. And he's very quick to praise Naughton as, and, and everyone else in headquarters company 3rd Battalion because they were a headquarters company. They weren't a rifle company. Mm. They had other jobs and he, and Brummett in this personal account was quick to call emphasis to the fact that these were men that had primary jobs and their secondary jobs were to function as infantry. And they all performed in a splendid way in ad hoc fighting formations because he broke them. He was the man that basically Charles Johnston gave him the responsibility of put up a defensive line and then man that defensive line and come up with a plan to rotate people in and out of that defensive line on a daily basis because the Johnston plan that emerged was we're going to stay on this hilltop, we're going to set up a defensive line and we're going to stay here and wait for the amphibious forces that landed on the beach to move into our positions. It's just that the Germans got there first. The Germans got there first. In fact, the amphibious landing force didn't get to Glenn until what, July 23rd? Yeah, it was a a month and a half later, wasn't it? But immediately, you see, we're now in that area where if Brummett was suggesting on the first day, let's bug out of here and let's go north towards a drop zone, you're deviating away from this idea. There was no other option. They had to stay with the French on the hilltop together, side by side against impossible odds. And and that's changing. And, And just referencing what's coming on YouTube, someone said, where who created the original verse of the story and i i will let you give your say i think i don't think any one person really did i think i think tour guides have some responsibility for it i think the french villagers have some responsibility the fact that the civilian awards were given to the people of grainier and they were made uh, 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 her- heroes and heroines out of it contributed to it i don't and and, and i want to stress as well there was no there was no conspiratorial reason for the story. It wasn't to gain money. It wasn't to to to, to ridicule real history. It just the the reason the story went its way was honest. It, it, it the intentions were honest. It just deviated down a little bit of a um, a curious alleyway. Um, does that make sense? It does totally. And I think Paul, I think you're 100 percent correct. This was a thousand points of light, a thousand different people together weaving a tapestry that became this traditionalized narrative. And if anything, I think it stands as a powerful cautionary tale to everyone that this is how folklore is created, that it's never one person with some sort of evil or self-aggrandizing objective that it is it's it's so completely chaotic and out of control because it's coming from so many places simultaneously that blend into this story. And I should just, I feel like I should mention that this is, this is, lot, this is a lot like being in a relationship and going through a divorce, this whole story for me, because um, I lost some of my religion over it because I get in the end excommunicated from the 507 family over this story. Mm. Um, I also, in probing deeper and deeper into this, it revealed to me that there were these there were these little rivalries and these hostilities in the village among survivors over this issue of when the United States came in in 1986 um, as a result of, of an initiative that was begun by, by Brummett and Naughton to recognize French civilians. And eventually the American uh, Secretary of, um, Secretary, I'm sorry, the Defense Department Secretary He came in and awarded um, two different awards, one of which was the Award for Distinguished Civilian Service, awarded it to a number of people in the village. And apparently that caused a feud and a cold war that goes on to this day, where I am aware of people who, I mean, I'm just not even going to mention names because some of them are still alive. People who their relationships terminated in 1986 because the Americans came in and recognized this person 
and they matters. feel like that person didn't deserve a damn award. I deserved an award. Why did he or she get one and I didn't? And, you know, they gave him an award and he went and gave information to the Germans where there were accusations of helping the Germans. And it descended into sort of a dark and unpleasant place in a way. Matt Mag and I had dinner with Martha Heese. I don't know it was two years ago or three years ago. Now, Donna Allen was there, whose father uh, was killed on deed. He's the 17 year old paratrooper in the. He wasn't killed at Grain yet, but he was killed. Anyway, we, Martha got out her, her certificate there, all crinkled around the corner, signed by, is it signed by Eisenhower? I can't, whoever, it's some, someone big, isn't it? And Mag was talking in French to her and I was listening and joining in and she said, oh, you must be proud of it. And she kind of said, yeah, it, it actually caused more problems than it, than it solved. And, and, and confessing exactly what you said, that it, it created division. It, I got it. Someone else didn't get it. Did I deserve it? And she kind of put it back in the drawer again and said, I don't, you know, I just, it's, it's not even what, don't even go there. She said, I mean, she was, she, she was very proud to have received it, but it was like, it, it came with a whole lot of baggage. Um, yeah, she, she's the one that I was going to mention by name because there were several people in the village who felt that she didn't deserve it. And because she was extremely young at the time, I think she's nine years old at, at the time of the invasion. And the extent of her contribution was that during this, this critically important exfiltration phase in the aftermath of the, June 11th, uh, yeah, the June 11th and 12th battle. There she is. There's Martha and Odette and some GIs after they all return with their little brother Gustav over there at the far left um, in one of the boats that were used to help carry Americans out during this exfiltr exfiltration because the exfiltration is basically, I define three separate groups that begin to exfiltrate from the area and in in two of those groups, they were helped out through the marshes and canals using that exact boat that's in the photograph, which is why that's kind of a, a really charming and I think a, a powerful image that's showing that they're proud of their what they did. Um, Martha Hiss was at that point as Americans were drifting back to the north in the aftermath of the battle when the Germans overran the hilltop. She was identifying groups of Americans and bringing them to La Grange, bringing them to the barn at the Rigaud family farm which I think is a contribution that deserves to be recognized. I think she, I think she deserved the award for distinguished civilian service. And yet there are a couple of people in that village that do not believe that she did. Uh, and I feel like any nine-year-old kid that was doing anything other than hiding in a basement at the time should be recognized. And she had a little bit of a fearless quality based on what I understood of what she did because Frank Naughton had very specific direct interaction with her. Mm. And one, based on what Naughton told me, it, I, I think she deserved it. And that's why it's been, it's kind of warmed my heart in years gone by when I've gone Back before 2020, when I used to be able to come to France. Yeah, the but good old days, yeah. The good old days, back when we all used to have fun. But I would go I would go to the memorial service at Glenn, and she'd be there, and she'd be wearing her award for distinguished service, civilian service. And it kind of made me feel good that the U.S. government went back and did that, that Brum and Naughton felt that those men who both became 06, they both become U.S. Army colonels later in life, mm. and both of them go on to fight in other wars. And then when they reach retirement age, the two of them to came together with the idea of we need to do something to recognize what those French people did for us in 1944. I think that speaks volumes about how important the French contribution was. And that's why what you said earlier couldn't be more true, that the, the way that the French contributed to this, this story is something that has just not changed in 18 no, years. No. Yeah. But the reason for it being re um, brought back to the to the to the mainstream in 2004 I still think connects to that whole freedom fries which is the only way I can categorize that period of history. Let's celebrate the Americans and French friendship with this incredible story and there were people from both you know the, the, there are American veterans still around there were French friends still around they had these great photos of Frank and Martha hugging and Odette was there and it was all perfect for the 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 job of selling to an audience of TV watchers this incredible spirit that they wouldn't get because there aren't when you actually boil down the civilian experience in Normandy there's a lot more tragedies you know we killed whatever it was fifteen thousand French in Normandy minimum over the course of several months and years lots of villages are completely destroyed as was Grania and there aren't that many stories you can pull out 
that really symbolize a friendship because we leave Normandy in ruins, not like going into Holland and Netherlands and perhaps later in the war when there's more tulips and flags and candy and stuff. But we left the France, put this part of France in a pretty shitty condition. We left it worse than we'd found it, essentially. And so this story had this amazing quality to, to recognize what these French had done. And it still, and it, again, it, it still does. It's just the minute of the battle. So um, let's talk about the, um, let's get to grips with the fact that the SS, when they do eventually take, well, we'll talk about the, do you want to do the, the exfiltration first or do you want to do about the, the, uh, the result? Which one do you want to, which way do you want to go? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll punch us through exfil real quick. Because okay, let's do that. It's really, it's. Well, and the I, final battle as well, yeah. Yeah, final battle, I should point out. So um, among the most recent things, I mean, this, this story is so alive that just, during the last two months, as a result of Nils and his incredible research skills, we've come up with a series of documents. And I should point out that in this case, a document, something that Nils was suspecting all along was confirmed when the mayor just, I don't hear from the mayor often, but when I hear from him, it's always solid gold. He'll go, hey, look at this document that I that somebody sent me. He forwarded over a document that confirmed to us something very important. And that is that the battle on June 11th on the hilltop at Klein was fought by a company-sized force of the 37th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 17th SS. And that's important because a company-sized force is, I mean, what's a German infantry company in 1944? A little over 100? Yeah, bad. Yeah. yeah. Smaller than a U.S. infantry company. And so that completely complicates the traditionalized narrative of 500 killed, 700 wounded, um, at which point it looks like an entire regiment was brought to bear against that hilltop. But what we now know is that it was, it was the second company of first battalion, 37th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 17th SS. And that was confirmed in this document that the mayor found and sent to me this summer. He just sent it to me a couple of weeks ago. Nils had, had suspected that all along. This document confirmed it. And so right off the bat, this document suddenly situates us solidly in this idea that the scale of this action is dramatically smaller than we ever believed it to be. Well, what we now know is that on the morning of the 11th, that the, the first battalion of the, of the 37th Panzer Grenadier Regiment moved up to the area just east of Gren at saint jean de and that they sent two companies in and forward and that one company went north to Rouge Fosse, which is the bridge crossing of the Virtot Canal, yep. just immediately north of saint jean de And that the other company was sent immediately west to investigate, to clear the area around Glen. And it was that company that it looks like it's, this part of the story has remained intact, that it threw effectively three separate actions during the course of the day on Sunday, June 11th, that this one company carried out um, a series of attacks that ultimately resulted in the hilltop being overrun by the enemy and and that it was a much smaller force. There's the famous, there's this, this I consider it famous, it may not be famous outside of my, my living room, but this famous, this aerial photograph that's taken on June 17th that I think speaks volumes about the way that that June 11th battle developed. And I think what happened is that that force uh, approached from the west that they went straight up the hilltop toward the church during the church service, which which completely harmonizes with civilian accounts and GI accounts that they were in the middle of the service at the church when the battle began, but that that first battle was repulsed easily. That would have, I think, it would make sense for that to have been the the vanguard element, not the not the reconnaissance element of of the of the of the battalion, but the first element to reach the hilltop, they make contact with the enemy and they pull back. That then they organize toward a second effort and that the second effort also sustains casualties and that they then organize a third and final effort toward the latter part of the day approaching sunset. And that that effort was supported by firepower Nils and I spend a lot of time talking about what that firepower would have looked like. He has very good ideas. He's very well informed on the, the, the table of organization and equipment of the 37th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. But it is looking like what we have, we've kind of whittled it down to a list of it could have been the model 1934 80 millimeter mortar, but it could also have been potentially 
the 75, um, what they called like the infantry Geschütze, that little, mm -hmm. the, the Germans yeah. nicknamed it the door knocker, that little light 75, which to me would make a lot of sense because it could move so easily. And there were some apparently um, in an artillery element, I think it's the fourth company, 37th um, Panzer Grenadier Regiment um, has some of that firepower, but it could also have been weapons ranging all the way up to 105 millimeter to maybe even 150 millimeter howitzer because the regiment had weaponry like that. This brings me to a fun point that I think you'll feel my pain on this. I published on and Keith Nightingale published on and all the veterans testified to 88 millimeter guns. And it's almost definitely not that. And isn't that sort of a tale that's old as time? Well, with that, GI that's part of the course, isn't it? 88s are rarely 88s. Tigers are rarely tigers. Uh, MG 42s yep. are rarely MG 42s. Let's move on. That's, uh, that's just yeah. Um, which which brings us to the uh, the greater thing you were talking about with James now the other day. But you know that you know and I remember standing in the grain and talking about yeah the 88s were over there somewhere and they they knocked out the church the church tower and the belfry and what have you and and. Um, and then, and then the, 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 the conventional version is, is that when they overwhelm them in Edmonds on the Hill, almost immediately the reprisals start and people's wounded start being dragged out. And Johnston in the original version is killed there in the, in the, in the, in the square somewhere near the church. And then the Germans start setting fire to things and killing people. And, so, and, and there's, there's, you know, the priest was killed. There were, there were French thrown in ponds and killed. There were people killed in, in vicious ways by the SS. But that maybe wasn't the final battle. That, that, so let's let's go to this this the the, uh, the final battle that you've now determined as actually was quite some way away. Yeah, there. So there's the main battle on the hilltop, probably around sunset on Sunday, June 11th, that results in the Germans taking the hilltop. The Americans break into three groups that then attempt to exfiltrate from the area. Um, for the most part, the two groups that that cheat a little to the northwest, they do well. In fact, almost all of them get out. Then there's Major Johnston's group. And the map that you're seeing now is a map that I prepared just the other day, because I believe um, that this was Major Johnston's plan with the group that got off the hilltop with him, and that that plan was to move south. They moved south across what is now the Hippodrome at Glen. They moved yep. south, uh, yeah. and that they then hit that one long route, uh, that road, I think it's called Route de la Terrette, that leads into Tribu over yep. a marshy area. That the plan was then they turn right on whatever that road is. I think that's D29. 29, 29 then, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, then up to um, back road near the Carenton, yeah. Right, they'd, then they'd hit the, you know, approaching Matisse and then turn right and swing into Caratan, which would have for them been exactly a 10-mile journey. Um, that, I think, was what his plan was. But then the next map shows what actually happened. And that is that Major Johnston with this group that gets off the hilltop, they go, they make it basically two miles into the 10 mile journey and make it to that bridge right there. Um, and I've narrowed it down to the possibility of two bridges. It's either the bridge that I've illustrated in that map, which is close to that big bend in the road. Yeah. Um, or else there's another bridge that's less than a mile farther to the Southwest from it um, over the La Terrette. That's the bridge over the Rissu de Fets, I think it's called. Yeah, I, I mean, when we say bridges, for those watching, we're talking almost roads over one meter wide tunnel -y kind of dike drainage things. They're, they're not bridge, don't think Arnhem, folks. We're, we're talking um, culverts almost, aren't we? Yeah, totally. But the the big issue that that I think Johnston had to confront was the fact that if we're going to exfil from this area, we've got to deal, deal with a couple of basically canals, like this Rissu de Fets, I think it's called, and yep, then the yep. La Tourette, and then the bigger issue, which is showing up in this image toward the right, toward the left-hand side, which is they got to get across the Tote River. Yeah. If they're, and there's really no, I mean, and the bridge over the Tote River is not that big. It's the Tote River is about 20 feet wide there, but still that's a significant obstacle. And I think what, what Johnston was going for was that bridge over the Tote River, because if he could get over the Tote, he could then make it into Carentan. The Germans had the effect of driving two of these exfil groups toward the Northwest and then Johnston's group for reasons that remain unknown and I am certain will remain unknown forever. Mm. Johnston's group pushed to the south. 
The reason that we know more about what happened next is because of the personal account from Georgie Coley, which was sent to me spontaneously about a year ago. Uh, it's a little over a year ago by Brian Siddall, uh, who is an expert researcher and has found a great deal of very important 507 documents. And there it is right there. Georgie Coley's uh, personal account where he was testifying as to the disappearance of Major Charles Johnston. And he describes vividly um, the, the movement toward this meeting engagement at the bridge site in the black of night where they walk up on guards on the bridge, that they approach that bridge knowing, having been forewarned, in fact, Coley mentions that they were forewarned. I'm assuming that that means that the French told them, don't go down toward the La Tourette, the Germans are there. Um, and I guess Johnston, just not really having any better options, chose to do that. He walked up on that bridge site, walked right up on the bad guy. There was an initial exchange of fire. And if you read on in the account, he, Coley describes how um, it's Lowell Maxwell gets shot in the stomach. Somebody that we heretofore thought died on the hilltop where yeah. he didn't die there. Here he is dying in this second battle. And that Johnston attempted to surrender to the enemy um, because he had wounded now because Maxwell's been shot. A few other people have been shot. And Coley then goes on to describe how they shot and killed Johnston there. Coley then sort of dragged himself along in this very shallow marsh and he escaped the scene um, narrowly to provide ultimately that, that personal account after the war when an investigation was launched to figure out where Johnston ended up. Another big thing that causes me heartache over this to this day, and I was rem reminded of it anew this morning when I read over the Brummett account once again, Brummett says something that supports the Coley document. And what Brummett says, I, I think I may not have sent you the Brummett stuff. I'll send it to you later on. Maybe you could post it. But yeah. Brummett says that when he left, so there's a group that leaves with Naughton and they move to the Northwest. There's a group that leaves with Brummett, leaving also toward the Northwest. Those are the two groups that make it out successfully. And he says that, Brummett says that when he left, that he got word that by then Major Johnston had been killed which to me suggests this possibility that somehow word, so maybe Coley got back, maybe the French got back and found Johnston or might found Brummett and said, hey, they tried to get out to the Southwest and they didn't make it. And so because Brummett testifies to knowledge of Johnston not making it out. Um, and the reason I think it's important is because we heretofore imagined Johnston, uh, loyal Bogart, from from the 101st Airborne Division and Captain Abraham Sofian, who was the battalion surgeon of uh, Headquarters Company 3rd Battalion 507th. We imagined all of them being executed by the Germans on the hilltop. There was even a story that held that Captain Sofian, as the battalion surgeon running the aid station with a couple of medics, including one medic from the 101st, that, and I should mention too, that a person that I can't let go by without being acknowledged, somebody who has made the 101st Airborne Division's side of this story make more sense for me was none other than Mark Bando, yeah, who has no been a, a supreme gentleman and can't give enough to me to help me understand this. Um, so he's a part of this team, even though the 101st is just sort of a small part of this story. And it's the bigger story really is a 507 story. They're still part of it. Mark Bando has done a lot to help me make sense of all of this. Um, but Mark Bando, like me, understood that the way that Abraham Sofian's story ended was that he was running an aid station with some 507th medics and a 501st medic. And when the Germans overran the hilltop, they dragged all the wounded out dragged them away, and then dragged Sofian away. Well, in the aftermath of the war, Sofian's body is found along the Route de la Terrette at the site of the second battle, as, as, along with Loyal Bogart's body, who we all thought died on the hilltop as well, yeah, yeah. along with Major Johnston's body, who we thought died on the hilltop as well. And so what I'm beginning to believe is that maybe what happened, and it's just a crying shame that Frank Naughton's gone, Dave Brummett's gone, and that basically anybody else, that George Coley, I never got to meet him. I still mm. don't know when George Coley died. I'll have to look him up and find a grave later. Um, but he didn't live long enough for me to ever meet him. But what I'm beginning to believe that maybe the plan that emerged just sort of in the heat of battle as the Germans are beginning to over on the hilltop was that Brummett um, and Naughton had come up with a plan to get out. 
that they were waiting for Johnston to give the order and that uh, Johnston may have sent a runner to let them know because Brummett would have been operating the defensive line immediately south of the village where the Hippodrome is today. And therefore, Brummett would not have been physically present on the hilltop, nor would Naughton have been, because they would have been down with that tactical main line of resistance. When the enemy, I think, cut around that main line of resistance and flanked around that main line of resistance, I think the enemy cut Johnston's ability to communicate with Naughton. Well, really, he, he was communicating with Brummett and then by extension, Brummett with Naughton. And so Brummett was severed from Johnston when when it looked like the hilltop was about to be overrun, Johnston had to make a decision on the fly. And it looks to me like the decision was like, oh, like, holy cow, I got all this, all these wounded. I'm going to try and get everybody from the, the command group right there on the hilltop, everyone who's left alive, who survived the bombardment. I'm going to get them off the hilltop and we've got to get across the Tote River. So we're going to go south along the marsh. We're going to cross the Tote and then go into Tribu and then turn north and head toward Carentan. And I think there's a possibility that Captain Sofian was with him. I mean, the, definitely the location of Sofian's body when it's discovered after the war supports that, that idea. Yeah. yeah. And I think also they may have taken the wounded with them off the hilltop when they evacuated. And so they're severed from communicating with Brummett and then therefore by extension, Naughton. And so Johnston makes his way down uh, off the hilltop to the marsh, runs along the marsh and then goes down Route de la Terre until he runs into the enemy, firefight, all hell breaks loose, and I think all of them get killed. In other words, I, what I'm dancing around here is to me what is the most awkward part of all of this, which is I'm beginning to believe that the Germans didn't execute anybody. Wow, which is, and yeah, we're getting to the, 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 the real crux of this now is that the, the the aftermath and we'll, we'll come up with the church in a minute as well, which is when, because for those watching folks last year, Marty had a little, little, well, not little, but a, a, there was a, the theater in Carenton spoke about his latest research to a group of French, Dutch, Belgian, there was what, 60, 70, 80 of us there. Um, and it was lots of, lots of, you know, lots of revelations and lots of, I mean, some people in the audience knew a bit more of my idea. I hadn't spoken to you for a while and it, but it was like revelationary stuff. But uh, do we, do we backpedal? People are enjoying this. It's one of my most popular shows for a couple of weeks. So this is great. Really? But great. the reason they had to go south also, do we bring up on the, uh, the, the Northern Bridge as well? I think we should mention the fact that for anyone who's been following yeah. this tactically, the Northern Bridge has been, been eliminated. This, and there's that lovely aerial color photo there. The 29ers who ended up in the battle and possibly Black had come in from the north, haven't they? They came in from the north, right? And, and that bridge is blown by Naughton on the 10th. Yeah. So what? What's so there was a bridge, and that is theoretically the closest and possibly easiest way to get to the closest Allied troops, because the 29th Division from Omaha are in strength closer than the 101st near Carenton. Right. But we have have you got any closer to understanding exactly the reason for the blowing up of the bridge because that's something that um doesn't really make sense to me right i do understand that quite a bit better now um for thanks to nils and thanks to the mayor and i'll tell you why that's because one thing that we now know for sure is that the the, the vanguard elements the lead elements of 17th ss had already reached the area near Carentan by that point. They had reached the area around Leve and what is that, Saint, uh, Saint-Hier de Petiville? Yeah, Saint-Hier de Petiville. Yeah, they'd got round that way, hadn't they? And they'd also yeah. been pushing up towards Isigny over in the, the east as well, hadn't they? So they're, they're, they're kind of the pincers, if you like, are kind of already going round from both sides, aren't they? Right. And so what I'm thinking the June 10th action looks like is that you get the Panzerjäger Abteilung, the anti-tank battalion of 17th SS, we know that they definitely made it to the area between Isigny and Leve on June yeah. 10th because the Americans capture some of them up there on June yeah. 10th and interrogate them. And they say- Which will be off, off this country. image to the north somewhere, be up here somewhere. Right, yeah. So they're north of Montmartin en Grain. Yeah. Um, the mayor has told me about a document. I haven't gotten it from him yet, but I, he's told me about a document that provides an indication that as the 17th SS was beginning to reach that area for potential push to the west toward Carentan, that, that um, Ost Battalion 439 was 
instructed apparently to patrol south from the area around Isin Leve and patrol south down to that bridge site. Yeah. And so Frank Naughton had been sent, sent up there to, uh, to guard that bridge. They placed explosives on the bridge. And the idea, I think that Major Johnston, who of course I never got to interview because he got killed, but I think that Johnston's plan, and I know that my, this might sound arrogant, but the deeper I get into this story, with each passing year, the more I'm beginning to see it through Major Johnston's eyes. That's a little bit, I think, arrogant of me, but you know, hey, come on. Can, at this point, have, maybe I've earned it a little bit, but the more I'm thinking that Johnston looked at the area and he thought, all I need to do is not freak out, not get excited and wait, and they'll be here to me in just a couple of days. And if I can wait it out, it will be better for me to just stay here and let the amphibious invasion force coming across the beaches come to me than it will be for me to in exfiltrate through enemy held area to try to get to friendly lines. It'll be easy for me to stay here. And so that he thought, I'll stay here. And, and if the situation changes dramatically and it looks bad, like the enemy's about to cut me off and I can't get out, I'll keep this back door open. And that's the that bridge at Pot de Planck, just north of Glen. It's a little over a mile and a half north of yeah, Glen. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, and I'll keep that bridge open. I'll send, I'll send some guys up there to watch that bridge. And if it looks like the enemy's gonna use it to attack me, I'll have them put explosives on it. And that way I have an escape route should I need it. And then also with explosives, if the enemy tries to take the bridge, we can blow it and that will prevent them from attacking me from the north. Because of course, after all, Johnston has arrayed his defenses oriented south because yeah. that's what he's yeah. expecting. If the enemy's yeah. gonna approach yeah. me, they're gonna approach from the south. And so he sends Frank Naughton up there with a handful of other paratroopers. They wire the bridge and then, then they're ultimately hit with a meeting engagement where German troops coming from the north engage them. There's a firefight, small arms fire is exchanged. Naughton has the men pull back and provides the order to blow the bridge. And from the Naughton perspective, I think what it looks like is if it was say a company sized force of Ost Battalion 439, which makes total sense because they were just in there the area. A company north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if there's a company up there that, that pushes south, and again, the mayor has told me he has documents showing Ost Battalion 439 pushing south. If to Frank Naughton with, I think Frank Naughton's force was 10 guys, maybe. Um, if it was a company sized force, I'd blow that damn bridge and pull out too. Because yeah, if I was now you're like saying that, that because I remember having these conversations with you three, four, five years ago. That makes much more sense now because it's the lesser of two evils, isn't it? Yes, they right. would like to keep that as an escape route open, but a hundred or plus Germans there north of it, the threat of an attack coming in that direction, unfortunately, trumps the yeah. uh, the keeping open escape route. So that started to make more sense. And I think we, all the things you've been saying so far, I think you have been going on a kind of an, an upward incline into understanding this. Story. I think you have peaked. You are, you're kind yeah. of picking up speed coming down the other side. Now you're, you're talking yeah. more confidently about it now than you were because we just talk ourselves into corners. You know, and then you had these same conversations with Niels and Sean as well. You just go, I don't know, let's, let's call it quits and go and have a beer. And now it feels like that the end is in sight. Yeah, there is there. You are making sense, but Let's bring back to the, the, the so we got the final battle taking place on the bridge, which explains now why their bodies were found there, i.e. DPFs and things that indicate that. And so, but the church, the, 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 the other, the revelation number one is you're beginning to think that no one was actually killed in a, in a reprisal manner by the SS. And, That's correct. Yeah. And, re, That's and correct. revelation number two is when I've stood there and there's probably guides watching now who've stood there and told their groups, and the Germans set fire and destroyed the church and the French had to build a new one down uh, in the village. The church wasn't actually destroyed by the Germans at all in that phase. And you have again, proof for this. So I, I can't remember what you said last year. When, when, did that mo when did that moment of clarity come to you? Then you realize, shit, the, the, the church is still there when, when all the conventional versions say it was gone. Yeah, um, uh, somebody sent me this great, a photo reconnaissance image that was taken on June 17th. And there it is. And I mean, it's a massive image, first of all, it's not that close up. That's a heavy punch in, which is why you get some pixelation. Yeah, yeah. But I have this image at 1200 DPI. So it's, it's doing pretty good. And when you look at the church in that image, the 
church has not been destroyed. The church doesn't even to me show that there's a little area on the uppermost roof of the bell tower that appears to show that there might be some damage, which would harmonize with personal accounts from Frank Naughton, from Dave Brummett. Yeah. I think that this image, this composite image here says it all. Yeah. Yeah. As of June 17th there, you see how there's one little section on what looks like, I mean, the, the uppermost height of the bell tower that there might be some damage. And yeah. that's just kind of a might. The, uh, but the it ridge is line certain. there looks intact. That looks intact. That looks intact. That looks intact. The, the overall structure seems pretty damn good there. Yeah. And then contrast it with the post-war image where the place is, is ravaged. Yeah. And th I think we're now left with just coming up with some theories, some educated theories. But if anybody can come up with these, it's this team about how you end up with um, a traditionalized narrative that holds that before dawn on June 12th, the Germans burned the whole village. Um, you, have to you have to reconcile that with the June 17th photograph that clearly shows the church, I think, is entirely intact on June 17th. Mm. And what that then opens up is two possibilities that I'm considering. And number one is, one thing that we do know is that the Germans occupy the area and the Germans are there for more than another month. They're there for almost six weeks, in fact, beyond the battle. Yeah. And the Germans will ultimately pull back from that area. And during that, that almost six week time period, the Germans, they evacuate all of the French citizens from the area and kind of prepare the battle zone. And one possibility is that the Germans burn it after June 17th and that it's the Germans that do it. They just do it before this photograph was taken. I'm sorry, they do it after this photograph was taken. Yeah. Another possibility that um, we have to consider and Colonel Nightingale and I had a nice long talk about this two months ago, is that the possibility remains that when the U.S. moved into the area late in, in the final week of July, it was 2nd Armored Division, and that when 2nd Armored Division moved through the area, if they crested that hill to the north at Port de Planck and they looked down into the Marais du Fetz, you'd see this towering hilltop with a church on it, and if you were given an order to move through that area, would you want to set foot into that area while the Germans can use that church as an observation point? I think not. And I therefore am in entertaining the possibilities that the church was destroyed by American forces in July when they moved through. It makes absolute sense. I mean, every, every armor division, American and British, by mid-July, early July, they've all had come under fire from at least spotters in churches, if not artillery in, in high ground. And you're getting to the point where it's like, shoot first, ask questions later, isn't it? And there's nothing really wrong with that. Um, and it also, I think we just to, to come back on your point about the fact the French civilians have been evacuated. I think that's key. They have a very, very stressful time on June the 11th. There are some very nasty things happening. There are, there's lots of flames, there's lots of smoke. There are some buildings under fire. There is some damage there. Then they go away for a few weeks and then they come back and you can understand completely how the idea of a church being damaged a bit becomes damage is destroyed because they've now seen the post where there is a completely destroyed church and so a progression of damage to the church becomes one single event and who best to blame it on the ss on the on uh, when they took the village it's a the best the best person to blame it on rather than potentially allied artillery stroke armor a, a month later and this this is the kind of the revolutionary stuff that we're getting to and it you know we're, we've been at this near an hour and a half now so we will need to kind of eventually bring things to an end mm -hmm. but it, the, the, to circle around what we're doing is we're understanding how any one of these single stories can be now taken apart and rebuilt and in some cases you build up a completely separate story and we'd all have to live to be 200 years old plus to, un to unravel even half of these stories. And, you know, you said it yourself in a message to me yesterday the day before, you feel that 20 plus years in, you're, you're, you know less about the Battle of Normandy now than you did 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of with you. I, I, I look back to my early days as a tour guy when I'd read run account in one book and I would stand at a battlefield and tell that story confidently. And then you read third and fourth and the fifth books and another book, and then you read an after action report and you read something else and you go, now I know less now. So you kind of pick one and run with it, don't you? And then, and then if you've got the time, you, you know, in my case, I investigated Angerville plan, made some sense of that. 
but none of us can do that with every every village in Normandy requires this amount of anal 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 analysis. You know, Villa Bocage is another one that mm -hmm. uh, some and already in the conversations, Wittmann's death came up earlier as a, another example of something that's been over discussed to the point where we've got further and further away from the truth. Maybe we will we will circle back in on the truth again later, but we're kind of we've got lost in the swamps now, metaphorically, and <laughs> with, 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 with Grenier. So, yeah, so where, where, what next for this story? Where, where, what, what are the things you want? Because there might be someone watching who's got some stuff. What do you now want to determine to take this to the next level? You know, it's funny you should ask that because just this morning, I was going through the material again in anticipation of this, and there were a few things that I found that, that, that I looked at and it struck me like just a minute ago, something flashed into my mind that I have on the to-do list for when we finish this up. And that is I have never requested George E. Coley's documents. Um, well, I can probably pull some documents from the National Personnel Records Center at St. Louis about him. And I have never done this, this really simple thing of investigating where and when he died. And it just dawned on me since we started talking. Mm. Um, just for the record, there are a few people like I have, I, I sent out three IDPF requests before the COVID lockdown began that haven't been filled. And I don't expect they will be filled anytime soon for people that I know were killed at the second battle site. So that for example, just to show you how challenging this is and how it's going to be more decades. That's why I, that's why I basically quit fast food, quit dairy and quit sugar. And that's because I've got to live long enough to come up with all of this and the odds are against me to begin with. So I got to eliminate all this stuff out of my diet so that I can live forever and I can continue researching this because it's going to take freaking forever to get IDPFs from the National Personnel Records Center and from the Department of the Army. So there are three people that I uh, were killed at the second battle site where I requested their IDPFs. Then COVID happened and an, a, an IDPF request before COVID was taken months and months and months. And now it's completely indefinite as to when I'll get that material. And I have learned so much from receiving that document. And in case everybody's not familiar with it, it's the individual deceased personnel file. And I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say this, they are often earth shattering in terms of what they reveal. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, though, you never know whether it's going to be whether what I call the good ones or one of the two documents yeah. you knew it already. Sometimes they come through and it's bloody hell. It's reams and reams of incredible support. The next time it's a page and he, but there's no indication when you apply for it is whether is this going to be a good one? Is this or is this going to be a really bad one? But, you know, the, 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 the point is, is that, that there's a face value, a visit to Normandy goes to this village of Grenia. There is information panels there. There's monuments there. There's names listed there. And we as tour guides, historians, authors, we are all part of the, the um, both the good of sharing history. And that's important to tell people what happened. But we've also, in this case, been part of the problem, not the solution. And that we've taken stuff at face value because it does make a good story. And I think that is the key thing with this, is that, that with this un understanding of history, there's a desire for all of us, because we're natural storytellers, to find a good story that, that provides this beginning, middle and end, that, that sells the theme we're trying to tell to people, whether you're writing a book or making a documentary of whatever it is you're trying to get across, sacrifice, bravery, commitment, logistics. And it's very easy to get caught up in, you've got your result and you're then follow, you're following the evidence that leads you to the result that you want. And, and actually it bears taking these things apart and analyzing them. And yeah, there's, um, what there, there's someone just saying on YouTube what happened after the extra, uh, the, uh, the the last final battle. The so so some very few from that southwestern route got out. Collie got out, didn't he? The people who did get out are mostly in the Frank Norton, the ones being taken across in the in the boats by Martha and Odette. So the the the, the extra the extra extraction really didn't go very well, did it? Ex exfiltration is the word I'm looking for. Um, so the, the Johnston the Johnston group gets, I, I think, con, I think completely destroyed. Aside from George Coley, it, yeah. it looks to me like George Coley was the sole survivor. I still don't have a good sense of how big that group was. I think it's less than twenty men. Um, it, it is possibly more than that, but that's another thing that on the to do list for this afternoon. Uh, but then Naughton gets out with a group. I think he's 
I think he told me at one point he got out with 22 people. It might've been 16 and then it grew to 22 um, after first light. Brummett testifies to getting out with a group of 80 men and Brummett gets all 80 of them out and they arrive in Carentan in the afternoon on June 13th. And I think that's, if there's something to be proud of in this story, it's the, it's the fact that so many get out alive. That to me remains a miraculous part because they leave about 30 dead up on the hilltop. I mean, that's gonna, I still say that it's the hilltop and the second battle site. Yeah. So yeah, we get yeah. about 30 that are killed. We get about um, 80 or so in the Brummett group. We get, we get about, it's Naughton's group starts small, gets bigger, and that constitutes the, the better part of it to where in the end, 150 people survive it. I'm forgetting to leave out a very important component of it. And that is that a number of people went into hiding, a number of, of paratroopers go into hiding in Glen in the area around it um, overnight on the 12th. So overnight on the 11th and the 12th, so that when dawn breaks on June 12th, there are people who find that they're in fighting positions. And in fact, in the first book, I talk about this Frank Costa guy who's in one of the fighting positions that's bypassed. And he testified that back behind me on the hilltop, I could hear shadowing, I could hear shattering glass and I could hear people shouting. And then he just makes for it with two other people in the position with him, they slip out on their own. That's how Hinchliffe got out. John Hinchliffe got out mm -hmm. that way. They were bypassed entirely. They don't fire a shot during the battle, but then they find, oh, well, shit, if the enemy's behind us, where are we going to go? We better get out of here. And then they are eventually, they be eventually become a part of either the Naughton or the Brummett group or both. There are people like there's a man named Frank Giuliano who was B yep. Company 501st. And Giuliano hid in hid an in the oven. oven didn't he? Yeah. yeah, you know the story. You know the story yeah. about Giuliano. Yeah. And yeah, eating, sadly, being fed I, apples by the French. Yeah, or eating, something. Yeah. eating the, the apples and being sick from it. He, after after yeah. this, he said he never wanted to eat another apple for the rest of his life. Um, but sadly, Giuliano, when I tracked him down, he was still alive, but he'd had a, a stroke and he couldn't speak. And, mm. it, and I tried to communicate with him a little bit through his daughter and it frustrated him enough to the point that I just sort of abandoned the effort and let the man be in peace and quit pestering with questions. But that was a frustration because I had about a million questions for him. And he, the, and he had been back to Grainier after the war as well. So he, unlike he a lot of the guys, he'd been back in what, the 64 or something? He was, he was 20, back for the 20th or 25th. There's a photo of him standing by the, yeah. the first the incarnation of the monument. Or was that the second? The first, I suppose, wasn't it? And was that, first, was that yeah. 65 or 64, 69? It's about then, isn't it? 60, I think it's 64 because it's that's that little plaque that's still there that says the inauguration of the Franco-American Memorial. By and the Ambassador was, David Bruce, over that one, yeah, yeah. Exactly, the US, I guess that was the ambassador to France. And we so, haven't, I just realized we haven't also addressed the other point is that the, the, the conventional version of the story is that all this fighting in the village prevented the SS from getting to Carenton. Well, that is absolutely, completely and utterly nonsensical. That the unit, the small company that and a bit to the north that were delayed a bit by Grania, there's other companies and pushing on, getting to exactly where they're going to get. And the battle at Grania has no impact. Yeah. Well, maybe a few more Germans would have got there, but the Germans who get, if for those who are watching Band of Brothers, you know, Bloody Gulch, June the 13th, all those Germans that are in that area there, any accounts you've read of the 29th fighting in the Isigny, Leverie, all those Germans are there at exactly the same speed they would have got there regardless of what's happening in Grenier. Is that, are we, are we, are we, are we okay on that? that that's a fact, isn't it? It is definitely a fact. In fact, the route of advance that they follow, their, their column of march, um, did not pass through Glen. It passed through saint jean Day and yeah. came up through isigny le -Bay. So the route of advance was to the east. They were effectively, um, unaf they were effectively unaffected. Um, and the only element of the 17th SS that it looks to me was slowed down and moving north was one company from the 1st Battalion of the 37th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Because uh, that's all it, it looks like fought the battle on June 11th and 12th. In fact, the big point that needs to be made here is that by June 10th, they, were, they weren't they were in Carentan, but they were basically in the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was just elements. So that's the, the Panzer Jäger Abteilung, that's the anti-tank battalion yeah. of, the, of the division. And then elements of the 37th are moving up, elements of the other regiment, the 38th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which is the regiment that until five years ago, I thought 
attacked Glenn. They definitely were not involved at all. In fact, I published an article where I said that, that I now know is wrong. It was the 37th. Um, the 38th was off to the east of the 37th, and they moved up, and they were in the area as well. So it appears that this battle did not, on any meaningful level, affect the outcome of the greater Normandy battle or the Battle of Carentan at all. Which is just what it is. And, and I think the last thing we want to discuss is the French names on the monument, because again, in some of the versions of the conventional story, every French name you see on the monument were also brutally murdered by the SS in the aftermath. And that is also not the case, is it? Uh, uh, some were, but others are the, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you sum that one up. Right, well, there are two women on there specifically that I'll mention as a perfect example. It's Madeleine Pezaril and Eugenie Dujardin. Um, in fact, in previous tellings in my book, and then also in the History Channel documentary, we described how the evil SS Panzer Grenadiers kicked in the door to the apartment where the two women lived and gunned them down in their beds. And that's definitely not true. We now know that what happened is that they, it's still kind of evil, it's just a little less evil. They, that they were ordered, when all the civilians were ordered to leave the area, that these that they were given a deadline. They were told by, I think it was actually by 12 noon on June 19th, they were all to be gone. And that these two older women lived near each other, that they loaded up a cart and they had a horse hauling the cart with their belongings that they would need for evacuation. And that they began leaving the area and the horse, which was old and sick, died. And that left these two women way behind schedule. Everyone else is already gone. And they were forced to then start moving on foot. They were older. And apparently the Germans found them still in the evacuation zone and killed them then. And that this was days after the June 11th and 12th battle. So it's beginning to look like they, they were murdered by the enemy, but they weren't murdered on the hilltop. They were murdered some distance away during the evacuation. So that changes that story in one, in one piece of evidence. There's a name also that's on the wall of a young man um, named Albert Moge. And one of the things that I now know for a fact is, and he's buried in the cemetery right there by the memorial. Um, and Albert Moge evacuated with his family. I think he was like 11 years old. He lived right there, the last house before the bridge north of town at Port de Plank. And I went and talked to family members about him he wasn't killed during the battle. He wasn't killed in the month of June, in fact. It wasn't until August that he died. And it was when the family returned to the area after their forced evacuation. And he was um, a, like, I, I know of cases that you dealt with at Angovilo Plain. Like so many young children in the aftermath of the Normandy battle, he went out somewhere near the house and found hand grenades or a mortar round or something explosive and dangerous. And that's what blew up and killed him. And it wasn't until August that he was killed. So yeah, and, when we and interestingly, sorry to interrupt, but that when I I, when I did I found out a similar story from my Angerville book, I then spoke to a few Frenchmen and said, yeah, that was a standard way of mayors to uh, group in accidental deaths at the end of the war in with bombing or whatever, because otherwise it just looked bad. It just is that we just don't want to we don't want to remind ourselves that some poor little kid was out there. And, playing bouncy bouncy with a mortar shell and blowing myself up so we just kind of put the date onto the same as the, the bombing five days earlier it was a standard way of just we don't want to talk about it if the war's over let's move on we're not going to bring him back back so that, and that makes complete sense that makes absolute complete sense you don't want to draw attention to the fact that some poor kid or adult dies in an unfortunate accidental manner just blame it on the germans it's easy they draw yeah. a line under it move on a big issue that i have to contend with now is this issue of as you know, this, this is a story that when I take people there, I rarely get to take people there because it's off the beaten path and I'm usually on these sort of slightly awful bus tours. At any rate, when I do get to take private tours there, I find something that almost every time reduces people to tears is that when we stand in the middle of that memorial and I tell them about what happened there, I will tell them about Albert Le Blastier and Charles Le Barbinchon the priests yeah. and how they died during the battle. And they're buried right there in the center of it all. There's Father Le Blastier, in fact. And their bodies are interred there. And you might have read the epitaph that's on where the two of them are interred right in the center of the memorial. It says, Cécile par les Allemands, 1944. 
And so there, they make no bones about it. The Germans shot them. I, while I don't want, I'm not apologizing for the SS. That's certainly the case. I'm certain. I'm just asking questions. I'm doing this more and more about lots of things in the Normandy battle where I go, well, this is the story, but what proof do we have? That's all I'm doing. And I'm entertaining the possibilities that Father Le Blastier and Father Le Barbinchon may have been killed in the preliminary bombardment that preceded the third assault on June 11th. Mm, wow. Yeah. Another story I've told that I'm now going to have to kind of... <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, and that, and that has brought us full circle to this idea of be careful what we take, we say. Yeah. And, and, and I've had the great react great reactions. You know, you said people in tears and the priest, and you can point out bullet holes on the monument outside and the wall there, and uh, and you can make you connect up all the dots, and it, and you so you 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 create that image in the mind of your clients that is exactly what you want to achieve. You make them understand the war at a more personal level from perhaps reading their Max Hastings or their whatever, their, and they look at it in divisions that you've you've done what you're supposed to do. You've you brought it down to individuals being killed. Um, and yeah, so I'm just, I'm, we'll round things up because we really were short to Neil just made a good point on YouTube there that, that the, the only possible secondary benefit you can take out of the Grenier is all these misdrops of paratroopers, not just there, but to the North and East and West, they do cause the Germans to limit in general terms, their movements towards the coastline. Um, so there is, th there is some kind of general knock on effect of all these misdrops on everywhere on D-Day, causing the Germans to not be certain what to do immediately. Yeah, so fact, I suppose we, we can take yeah. that as a general benefit from it, but not definitely not this idea that the, the Battle of Grenier had a direct linear benefit to helping and aiding the liberation of, of, of Carrington. Yeah, and in fact, it was Nils that pointed out to me that there was a reserve force associated with 352nd Division that in the pre-dawn hours on June 6th, that that reserve force was committed to patrol to the east to investigate reported allied paratroopers. And that that reserve force having been committed far over to the east, that when the sun rose on June 6th, they were no longer within um, close enough proximity to Omaha Beach to be organized into a counter a counterattack at Omaha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so there, there, there is some... There's always, there's always a, a, a other effects that you can look at. So anyway, this has been extraordinary. People have really enjoyed this show. I, I was looking I forward so. to it. I don't, I think there's still many more rabbit holes we could go down on this. There's many yeah. more side stories, but the point is as a case study of a single battle, it is fascinating where we are now, where we weren't 20 years ago. And, you know, this year with COVID, the, the only positive that come out of it for me is where I would have been to whatever it was, point you hog a hundred times. I haven't been there at all this year. What I have done with my TV shows and has been out to lots of places once or twice and gone, to, you know, we just found a couple of new Vinda Vinda Stons desk near Omaha, well, near Long Sommer, we're going to have a look at next week, which I've never been to before. Not very exciting, not going to change the, the world, but have a look at a bit of concrete I've never seen before. That's a, yeah, and, that, and you don't know what little bit of information you can squirrel away from that that will be registered somewhere that you'll pull out when you need it at some point. Oh yeah, but there was a German position there and you, you've learned something. So anyway, fantastic stuff. I will just remind for people watching, I've busy few days coming up to Christmas. Monday afternoon, the amazing Professor Frank McDonough is joining me to talk about the second volume of his incredible study of, of the, the Hitler years, the disaster period, 1940-1945. I'm really looking forward to that one. Tuesday evening, I've got Dennis Sprague to talk about Glenn Miller's last flight and another show where we will take apart all the stupid bullshit <laughs> ridiculous versions of the story and actually just say yeah but here's what actually happened um and he's got all the documentary evidence to back that up then i'm going to interview with donnie edwards later in the week about his best defense foundation so lots of stuff coming up please don't forget to check out our patreon page click the click the subscribe button if you haven't already click the little bell to get the notifications check me out on twitter check me out on facebook uh, Marty is a prolific writer and uh, armor and rifleman magazines and this, that, and the other. And you find stuff here, there, and everywhere that Marty's done TV appearances, YouTube clips. So Marty's out there doing stuff as well. 
And it, I think that the single way, simple way to end this is that none of us know it all. And it's all just a pro procession, so a, a gradual progression towards understanding something that you have to admit to yourself, you will never fully understand. You just get a bit further down the a tunnel that the end of which keeps going further and further and further into the darkness. But, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it makes me enthusiastic to get out the books and start learning stuff again and keep on going through this stuff. So thank you very much, Marty been extraordinary we'll have you back on again talk about something else perhaps something shorter next time we'll do like an edited highlights package but this has been great people have really enjoyed this and uh, if it has been my most popular show for a good a good 10 days so well, fantastic I'm so good every thank you for watching everybody and um any final words marty just say good night goodbye everybody and then <laughs> well paul thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this important subject and talk about the work that this team of people has done to bring us to this better level of understanding. Yeah, and if you have anyone who's watching, get in touch with Marty or Niels or Sean or me. And if you've got some vital bit of the story or and I, that, that you think we need to know or something from the German side or the French side or whatever side, or then please share it with us. Because as Marty said, this is everybody has been putting towards this. And we grad, well, I feel that with Marty's recent work and Niels' work, we're actually getting a little bit closer towards a resolution, um, albeit with some question marks. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Um, I will see you all again. This is me, Paul Woodard from World War II TV saying, I'll see you all again very shortly. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's just us now. Brilliant.